ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help. It is Monday, May 20th, 2024, and I'm calling to order night eight and possibly the final night of Arlington's 2024 Arlington Town Meeting. It's reasonable to believe that we could have been done by now if we hadn't adjourned as early as we did on some nights. Um, just, it's just a reminder, um, not judging here. It's ultimately the meeting's decision, uh, but I do want everyone to be mindful of the relationship between the length of the meeting each night and the number of nights required to finish all business on the warrant. Um, so just be mindful of that going forward. Also, I want to remind everyone about the purpose of announcements and resolutions at, at the beginning of the meeting. Let me quote from the town meeting guidelines, which you can find on the town meeting webpage. Quote, near the opening of the meeting each night, the moderator calls for announcements and resolutions. Announcements are generally for sharing upcoming community events, forums, etc., that are relevant to the community. End quote. Going forward, let's please keep announcements focused on events located in or around Arlington. For the purpose of announcements, it's not enough for residents to have a connection with an event that happened elsewhere. If someone feels that an event that happened elsewhere is worthy of the meeting's attention, please contact me, as one town meeting member did about uh, Armenian Genocide Remembrance Day. That member discussed that topic with me at length, and I did additional research on the topic before deciding to include it in my remarks on opening night of town meeting this year. If you're unsure whether an announcement is appropriate, please reach out to me and I'll be happy to discuss it. Lastly, when you leave tonight, please make sure to turn in your clickers before you leave especially if tonight is the last night of the annual town meeting. And if there is a higher power, may it have mercy on us and let it be the final night. <laughs> and with that, uh, please rise for the national anthem. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Before I make the motion, I want to apologize to everybody. I conferred with the moderator, and he told me I had to make this motion. He, he uh, it, is, it, it, it is moved that in the highly unlikely event that all the business of the meeting as set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at this session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, May 22nd, 2024, at 8 p.m. We have a reluctant second. All those in favor say yes. All those opposed say no. No. Do we really need to take an electronic vote on this? It is an affirmative vote. Because we have no other options. Okay, uh, okay let, let's take a test vote. Okay, and the test question is, is it predicted to be over 90 degrees Fahrenheit in Arlington this week? This Arlington. Okay. And the motion fails. It will not be over 90 degrees in Arlington this week. Uh, 
I have it on good information that uh, it is predicted to be over 90 degrees, I believe, on Wednesday. Um, so. Okay, are there any, we'll cycle through the screens, and while we're doing that, uh, any announcements or resolutions? Yes, uh, Mr. Ruderman. And anyone else with uh, announcements or resolutions, you can uh, find a seat near the front. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Michael Ruderman, Precinct 9. This is on behalf of the Arlington Historical Commission. Next Tuesday night at 7.30 in this hall, there will be a presentation, the final one of the Arlington Historical Society season. This one is entitled Civil Rights Movement in Arlington, based on the Lenore and Howard Winkler collection. The presenter is Richard Duffy. It is co-sponsored by the Arlington Human Rights Commission. It is a look back at the 1960s in Arlington and I think it should be extremely engaging. Thank you. Uh, front row, yeah. Grant Cook, Precinct 16. I am, I confess I am not Greek, nor am I a member of the parish St. Athanasius. So if I'm stealing a Greek person's thunder here, I apologize, but just wanted to announce that I think our yearly Greek fest is coming up June 6, 7, 8, 9, starting with Euro night on Thursday and then lots of festivities Friday and Saturday and great food. So I know I will be there. I hope many of you will as well. Thanks. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Ms. Malofchuk? Beth Malofchuk, Precinct 9. The alewife are running in Millbrook. It's about a 15 mile run upstream from the ocean. So if you're curious, if you've never seen this, please come to Cook's Hollow where you can see them, or if you can find a, an access point in Mount Pleasant Cemetery where you can view the brook, you can see them there. You can hear them there, but you can definitely see them at Cook's Hollow. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Yeah, Mr. Helmuth. Eric Helmuth, Select Board Member. Uh, in this very room on Sunday, June 9th, there will be a really interesting musical concert. A lot of people don't know that one of the world's most renowned composers, Alan Hovannis, graduated from Arlington High School in 1929, is one of the most prolific composers in the Western classical uh, tradition, and there'll be a concert here, June 9th, 3 p.m., right here, uh, featuring his music. This has been a long time in coming. It's spo sponsored by the Armenian Cultural Foundation. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you'll be there, too. Okay. Any other announcements or resolutions? Yep, in the back. Joe Bart, uh, Precinct 5, um, but also a member of the Arlington Soapbox Derby Board of Directors, and I just wanted to announce that as of about an hour ago, the Select Board approved our uh, re uh, request for closing Eastern Avenue, as we have done for the last 15 or so years, for a soapbox derby race, which is America's oldest and greenest form of racing, uh, gravity-powered, no engines, uh, and we would love to see as many people as possible out there cheering the kids on as they go down the hill between the Brackett School and Robbins Farm Park. Uh, our date is uh, June 8th, which is a Saturday. Uh, we usually get racing around 9 a.m., and like I said, we'd love to see as many people out there as possible, and if you have a kid who's interested in racing, please come see me, and we're happy to set you up with a car uh, three weeks away, but we've still got plenty of time to get people going. So thank you very much, and we look forward to seeing you on the 8th. Great. Any other announcements or resolutions? Seeing none. Um, are there any reports of committees? Seeing none. Um, that takes us to Article 50, 54. Uh, Ms. Deschler? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, Article 54, uh, every few years town meeting appro appropriates a sum of money into the uh, private way revolving fund to help replenish funds that are used to make private way repairs. These funds are ultimately reimbursed by abutters of those private ways to the town. This year the Finance Committee recommends a positive vote on Article 54 which will add $100,000 to the fund. Okay, so let's uh, switch over to the speaker queue and clear it just once as well.
Okay, seeing no speakers, we will go directly to a, a vote on the main motion of Article 54. It is a majority vote. And while we're waiting for the, um, uh, the vote screen to come up, uh, this, will, this, is see this article is seeking to appropriate $100,000 to the Private Ways Repairs Revolving Fund. I assume those are folks who are trying to vote, but... Uh, Okay, voting is now open for 20 seconds on Article 54. This is a majority vote for a $100,000 appropriation to the Private Ways Repairs Revolving Fund. If you're in favor, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, it's uh, unanimous. 177, the affirmative, zero, negative. Uh, Ms. Deschler? That takes us to Article 55. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. <clears throat> um, the town is undertaking an analysis of a possible rebuild of the Fox Library. State funds are available to assist with the assessment, planning, and design of um, a library rebuild. These funds, however, are contingent on the town first raising $150,000 of, of our own funds. Um, um, the Finance Committee recommends uh, an appropriation of half that amount, $75,000, contingent on the library raising the uh, balance uh, of uh, $75,000 to make $150,000 total. Um, to be clear, the Finance Committee has not taken a position on whether to rebuild or what the re rebuild would be. We just think it's a, it's a reasonable uh, uh, expense to um, get some more information. Uh, and Mr. Moderator, if I may, I'd like to turn the mic over to our library director, Ann Litton, uh, who can provide more information about this subject. Okay, Director Litton. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Ms. Chair. Anna Litton, Director of Libraries, and it is my great honor to serve the community of Arlington. In April 2023, the Town of Arlington submitted a letter of intent to apply for Massachusetts Public Library Construction Program funds to rebuild the Fox Branch Library. We come before you today to ask for your support for Article 55, an article of appropriation as required under the grant. Next slide, please. The vote before you today is to apply for construction program funds and to appropriate $150,000 for planning and design contingent on a grant award. We are grateful to the Finance Committee who voted for favorable action on this article with the general fund appropriation of $75,000 in March. The Board of Library Trustees voted to appropriate $75,000 from library trust funds to support this article in April. This required vote asks town meeting to record your support for this project and efforts to secure funds. Next slide, please. The Fox Branch Library is a crucial component of library services in Arlington and an increasingly popular destination for library patrons. Over the last 10 years, branch attendance has doubled and circulation has tripled. Of note, in FY23, 29% of visits to Arlington's libraries were at Fox. We have seen this huge growth at the Fox Library despite deficiencies in the building. The current Fox Branch Library is inaccessible. The open floor plan doesn't support adults who need a quiet place to work. Problems in the 1969 building mean that our lower level suffers from poor ventilation and dangerous mold. Through this grant opportunity, we seek to rectify known problems identified in the building and to create library spaces that meet the needs of all in our community for decades to come. Next slide, please. Last year, the library contracted with Library Planning Associates and launched a community engagement process to learn about the community's needs at the Fox Branch Library. Through the surveys, listening sessions, tours, and common boards available to all during this process, we identified priorities for the future of the Fox. We ask you to join with us as we set a path for the future of the Fox. 
Our intention is to rebuild the Fox as a fully accessible library that welcomes all, including residents who are unable to enter the current building and provide the spaces for work, study, and play that community members need for today and into the future. Next slide, please. Construction grant funds will be necessary for funding this vision. Arlington received $3.3 million from this construction program in 1994 when a major addition was added to Robbins Library. As in 1994, these funds can help the town create library spaces that meet expressed needs in our community. A yes vote today will help the town of Arlington in our efforts to secure up to $100,000 for planning and design, as well as millions of dollars in construction costs should Arlington be awarded this grant. A yes vote today is a stepping stone on a path to better library services in Arlington. Next slide, please. The grant phases and timeline document available in the annotated warrant and at the back of the room explains where we are in this process today and our steps for the future. We are in the pre-planning and application phase of work during which we have identified needs and set priorities for a new building. Should you vote to ap approve today's request, we will move to a planning and design phase and will work with an architect to create plans and cost estimates for a new Fox Branch Library. It is my hope that we will return to this body in April 2026 and request your approval at, for design and funding for a construction phase. A yes vote today keeps us eligible for planning and design, as well as millions of dollars in construction funds. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention, for your time on behalf of the community of Arlington. And as always, we thank the residents of Arlington for being such wonderful library patrons and truly voracious readers. Thank you. Thank you, Dir thank you Director Linton. Uh, and apologies for not opening the speak speaker queue earlier um, or clearing it. So, so let's switch over to speaker queue and clear it just once uh, so everyone knows when it's opening. Okay. So anyone wishing to speak on Article 55, now is your chance. Uh, Mr. Wagner and then Ms. LaCourt. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Wagner, Precinct 15. Uh, I uh, am a resident who really has appreciated the Fox Library and for over 10 years brought family members there. However, I'm concerned that the town has a huge deficit coming up very soon. I would ask that the town use this money to uh, look into things like ramps and elevators. Also, I would remind all of us that public properties like the Parmenter School and other schools and town buildings, including the Fox, are assets that are incredibly and increasingly hard to find. And once you lose them, say giving them to a private developer for any reason, you don't get them back. So I don't know the project, but I would ask that we support this, but we keep our minds in future years as a body from giving away public buildings to private development. Thank you. That's not really within the scope of the article, but uh, let's see, uh, Ms. LaCourt and then Mr. Loretti. Annie LaCourt, Precinct 13. I'd like to start with a question, probably for the library director. Um, where does this idea that there's gonna be private development involved in this project come from, or that we would somehow give this asset away? Uh, director Litton. I didn't hear the question, Anna Litton, Director of Libraries. So I think what I'm asking you is um, when Carl says he's concerned about private development, I know that we have discussed the possibility of um, a joint uh, venture that might have some affordable housing on top of a new Fox Library. Do you want to speak to that a little bit and whether or not that would end up with us giving our asset away? Absolutely, thank you. Uh, Anna Litton, Director of Libraries. I 
I am asking you to approve Warrant Article 55, which is solely about the library space. While I can ask uh, Director Ricker to speak about the possibility of uh, co-locating housing with the library, that is not part of the grant that we are seeking. The funds that we are seeking are solely for a library space in Arlington. Thank uh, you. May I ask Claire to speak? Excuse me. Director Ricker, did you want to add to that? If that's okay. Um, right. I, I think, well, I, just to be clear, I think it's been established that Article 55 does not cover any private I'm, development. I'm on, happy for you to rule it out of scope to discuss yeah, that. Further. Yeah, I, th I think we're, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Claire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's be really clear about what this article is doing. It is allowing us to leverage some money for some additional money that will allow us to do some planning that will result in the plan for a project, which could be a renovation or a rebuild of the Fox Library to bring it up to modern standards. As Anna alluded to, and she probably has some more detailed statistics if you're interested in them, the um, library is one of the most heavily used libraries in the state of Massachusetts, not just in Arlington. And so it's a very popular place and has proven its worth and it is worth us considering a renovation of that building. Um, the reason to use this leverage now is not the $100,000 that we'll get to match the $150,000, but the potential millions of dollars we might get in state money once we're in the sort of tunnel for that particular appropriation. Where any additional funds would come from, I think is still up in the air. Obviously, we could do a debt exclusion. I don't believe we did a debt exclusion ever to build a library, including the addition to the Robbins Library. And the library trustees could do private fundraising, which is very common for public libraries. But if we are going to use any town funds, that will have to go through the capital planning process. And it would have to fit within the capital plan, and the capital plan fits within our operating budget. So nobody is talking about spending money on the library that conflicts with potential um, tax increases to cover our future operating needs, where the share of that operating budget that we use for capital projects and that we live within is very clear. So I think that this is a small step down a path where we have a lot of points at which we could say we have to stop this process because we can't handle it financially or we have to stop this process because we need to know something we don't know yet. But we leave money on the table if we don't pass this particular article now and that money can help us determine what kind of a vision we might have for this library, what's appropriate for us and whether or not we have the resources to stretch to fulfill our dreams for the Fox Library. So I urge you to vote yes, thank you. Okay, Mr. Loretti and then Mr. Greenspawn. Thanks, Ms. Moderator, Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I have a couple questions about this article. Um, the first is, is there a plan to expand the size of this library, and is that, in that, is that what will be part of the um, proposal? Uh, Director Litton? Anna Litton, Director of Libraries. Uh, we have developed a uh, program, essentially a layout of space based on community needs that we heard through the, the community engagement process I discussed earlier. Uh, a proposed space would include spaces that the Fox Branch Library is currently missing, uh, including small group study rooms. It would include a larger play space for children. Uh, we are hoping to create a library that would include more usable space on two floors. Would it also um, lead to more staffing by the libraries, librarians, or others? There is no plan to increase staffing. We are, again, looking forward to moving forward with the children's librarian, a full-time um, branch manager, and library assistants. Right. And, and staffing is starting to get outside of scope a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, it, gets, it gets directly to the question of whether this is going to increase cost to the town, because if we have a larger library, that is going to increase the operating cost of the town if, in, if it results in additional staffing. 
And that's what I was trying to get at, Mr. Moderator. But getting back to the space itself, there was a comment made earlier that the library doesn't have enough um, space for people who want to work. Um, I guess as a more of a philosophical question, before I retired, I was working from home. Is it the belief of the library trustees and others that it's the, town respons the town's responsibility to provide space to, for people who want to work? Is that a question about the library specifically? Yes, because she said library? earlier there's not enough place for people to work. Did you hear her, Mr. Moderator? So, Director Lynn, is, is there intention for workspace at the Fox Library? Libraries have always been an important place for community members to work. Okay, so it sounds like the library wants to create more space to compete with like um, job share locations and that sort of thing. And I really don't think that's appropriate. Hold on, hold on. No, she raised the scope question, folks. If you listen to what she said, she raised that. Now, maybe you think that's fine, but I don't. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Greenspawn, then Ms. Hyam. Andy Greenspawn, Precinct 5. I move to terminate debate on the article. Second. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate and an enthusiastic second. Uh, all those in favor of terminating debate on Article 55 say yes. Yes. All those opposed say no. No. Debate is terminated. So we'll go now to a, a vote on the main motion of Article 55. Uh, and this is a majority vote, and this, seek, this, article, this motion seeks to appropriate $75,000 for the assessment, planning, feasibility, and design of the Fox Library. Voting is now open, so if you're in favor of that appropriation, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, and three to abstain. Let's close voting. And the motion passes, 178 in the affirmative, six in the negative. That takes us to Article 56, I'm sorry, um, yes. yes, 56, which is a select board article, Mr. DeCourcy. And uh, before Mr. DeCourcy speaks, let's open up the, uh, switch over to speaker queue to show that briefly and clear that. Thank, thank you, so Mr. Moderator. Uh, Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. Before I begin, I would like to ask for an additional six minutes out of an abundance of caution. We will be receiving a presentation tonight from our town treasurer, uh, Julie Wayman, to slide presentation in case there's some issues with that on timing. Okay, uh, so we have a request for an additional six minutes for a total of 13, um, uh, and we have a second. Uh, all those in favor of the additional time requested say yes. All those opposed say no. no. Uh, the time is uh, granted. Thank you. Uh, by unanimous vote, the select board recommends favorable action to accept a local option that would allow the town to diversify its investments in its trust funds by investing pursuant to the prudent investor rule standards contained in general law chapter 203C. This leg legislation was approved, or this local option was approved by the legislature last year. The Massachusetts Collectors and Treasurers Association supported the legislation. Significantly, the legislation, the article is supported by the three bodies in Arlington that have primary responsibility under state law and our Town Manager Act for administering the town's trust funds, they being the Board of Commissioners of Trust Funds, the Board of Library Trustees, and the Board of Cemetery Commissioners. Our Treasurer, Julie Wayman, recommended that this article be inserted in the warrant, and the Select Board supports her recommendation. Presently, our trust funds may only be invested in equities from a list of 22 stocks. If you could ask if that list be put up behind me uh, while I'm speaking, it is a list that is published annually by the Mass Division of Banks. A positive vote tonight will change that and allow the town a much wider choice of investments in stocks. While the list is published annually, it is rarely changed. The list that may be put up in a moment has not changed since 2009. There's 22 stocks on that list. The only tech stock on that list is Hewlett Packard. And the, re 
And the reason why Hewlett Packard is on that list is the list sometimes changes because of mergers. The list was created in the 1980s. Digital Equipment Corporation was on the list in the 80s. Digital was acquired by Compaq. Compaq was acquired by Hewlett Packard. That's why it's there. It never changes. Ironically, a prudent investor would not limit himself or herself to a list of 22 stocks that haven't changed in decades. Our trust fund commissioners want more choices to meet their investment objectives, and passage of this article will allow for that. The prudent investor rule is not new to Arlington or to the state. Arlington used the prudent investment rule for its OPEB, other post-employment benefits trust fund, until it transferred management of this fund to, a state, to the state a year ago. The legislature enacted the prudent investor rule in 1998. It is a uniform act that applies in 45 states. The rule itself has been applied by Massachusetts courts since 1830 and expanded through the passage of the act. Ms. Wayman will discuss the prudent investment rule further in her presentation. She will also detail next steps, which will include an update to the town's investment policy and inclusion of the finance committee, select board, and the various trust fund commissioners in that process. Although the select board recommendation is the main motion before you tonight, you'll be made aware that the finance committee does not support this Warren article. I served on the finance committee for over 20 years. I have tremendous respect for the work of the committee and for its members. However, on this issue, I disagree with their vote to hold off on accepting this local option and for the reasons the committee discussed in support of their vote. Some of the concerns that you'll hear and that we heard after we heard that the Finance Committee voted no action, we invited Ms. Deschler up to the Select Board to discuss to see if we could reach any compromise. Some of the issues that we heard is that Arlington doesn't need to be first on this. Um, we're not first on this. this. This process actually started back in 2005 when the town of Brookline sought home rule legislation to allow it to apply the prudent investor rule to its trust funds. Between 2006 and 2022, there are approximately 12 or 13 communities across the state that received permission to do this. There have been three statewide bills that were sought in 2011, 2017, and 2019. Finally, in 2023, the legislature approved the legislation. This has been around for a long time. Next issue that we heard from the Finance Committee is they want the investment policy to be updated before they go along with the proposal. And our present investment advisor, as well as others across the state, have recommended that you obtain approval first before you update the investment policy. That's the procedure that the town manager and this Wayman have offered to the Finance Committee to allow them to have a say in the updating process to uh, allow input. Uh, the other thing I want to say is our investment contract is going out to rebid at the end of this calendar year. Um, and we don't have time to come back next year with, with an update. We will have a new contract. The treasurer would like to incorporate the new standards with this vote into the bidding documents that, that are received later this year. Uh, final thing I'll say in the final time that I have is that there was concern raised that a mistake by a former elected treasurer will be repeated if we do this. For those of you who've been in town, town meeting for a while, that occurred back in the 2008 time period. It concerned the override stabilization fund. It's completely different than the trust funds. We support Select Board heard from our treasurer, we support her, and we urge you to support her recommendation as well. With that, I will turn the presentation over to Ms. Wayman. Ms. Wayman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Julie Wayman, Treasurer Collector. As Mr. DeCourcy said, I am here tonight to present you all the new opportunity from the state to change how our trust funds are invested. Next slide, please. Here in Arlington, the Board of Commissioners of Trust Funds, the Cemetery Commission, and the Library Board of Trustees, as outlined in the Town Manager Act, are responsible for the management and administration of the $28 million contained in the respective funds. Each of these boards and the Select Board voted in favor of this change to move management of our trust funds from being governed by the mass legal list to use of the prudent investor rule. The town last went out to bid for investment management services in 2020, 
and Rockland Trust began managing these funds in 2021. Since that time, our funds have been managed using the Mass Legal List. Of these $28 million, there is an initial principal value that is unexpendable of $8 million. Next slide, please. The Mass Legal List allows for an investment portfolio divided between fixed income and equities or stocks. Fixed income includes investments that are interest-bearing and designed to produce more reliable income, like Mass and other state municipal general obligations. An updated investment strategy that will continue to incorporate funds in both asset classes. The access we are trying to gain is to a larger and more diversified list of stocks for that portion of our portfolio. Next slide, please. The Mass Legal List was created by the state in 1983 and originally contained 36 stocks, as you've heard. This list is now down to just 22. Being required to invest using the Mass Legal List means the equity side of our portfolio is restricted to investment in these 22 stocks. Many conversations over the past few months with treasurers, members of the Mass Collector Treasurer Association, and two investment advisors have characterized this list as sector concentration risk. This list only includes stocks representing seven of the 11 sectors of the stock market. There are no stocks in the energy, communications, materials, or real estate sectors. Consumer staples include six names and representing over a quarter of the list, and healthcare includes seven, about a third of this list. There is only one consumer discretionary, McDonald's, and a single technology stock, Hewlett Packard, as you heard. For comparison, the New York Stock Exchange has 2,300 stocks. Next slide, please. The prudent investor rule requires that a fiduciary shall invest and manage property held in a trust as a prudent investor would by considering the purposes, terms, and other circumstances of the trust, and by pursuing an overall investment strategy reasonably suited to the trust. The prudent investor is a widely accepted legal standard that universally governs trusts, and not just within Massachusetts or municipalities. The prudent investor rule is how individuals' trusts are managed, and this is the legal standard to which management of those trusts are held, including private trusts. As noted at the top of my presentation, Boards, the boards and commissions responsible for these trust funds ask for your approval for this change, allowing us to update the investment policy to include investment of our trust funds using the prudent investor rule. This updated policy will ensure we continue to invest our funds safely and strategically. Next slide, please. Though the state has recently changed and how we are able to invest our trust funds, the prudent investor rule is not new. This list of communities on the right are those that have successfully adopted this rule through home rule petition over the past 15 years. And those listed on the left have successfully adopted it at a recent special town meeting or a recent completed annual town meeting. Communities in the middle plan to take up this issue at an upcoming town meeting. And it should be noted that this is a list of communities we were able to determine through internet research and likely not a comprehensive list. And actually, since putting this list together, North Andover and Middleton have both also both adopted in favor uh, using the prudent investor rule. Next slide, please. If town meeting is to vote favorably on adopting this change, our next step will be to incorporate the use of the prudent investor to govern our trust funds into an updated investment policy. We would incorporate this change into the policy which hasn't been updated since 2020. We would, we would in investing in excuse me, in updating our investment policy, we would ask the select board, the finance committee, along with the board of commissioners of trust funds, the cemetery commission, and the board of library trustees to review and comment on the updated investment policy and then incorporate that policy into an updated RFP when going out to bid for investment management services likely at the end of the calendar year. Next slide, please. In conclusion, I think it's also important to mention that the prudent investor is not a new concept or rule even in Arlington. Our $26 million in other post-employment benefits, or trust funds, such, also known as OPEB, are invested using the prudent investor rule, which has been the case since 2008. As a reminder, this request tonight is to specifically and solely change how our trust funds are invested. These funds were donated or gifted to be administered by the Board of Commissioners of Trust Funds, the Cemetery Commission, the Board of Library Trustees, and for very specific purposes. I am not talking about general fund money. These boards and commissions want to see this change, voted in favor of the change, and submitted letters of support for your review. I hope you will also support this change. Thank you.
Thank you. Before we head to the speaker queue, I did want to offer uh, Ms. Deschler an opportunity as chair of the Finance Committee, since th there was a difference uh, in resulting vote from the select board. The select board does have the controlling vote uh, for the recommended vote under this article, but I wanted to give Ms. Deschler an opportunity to speak as well. Thank you, Ms. Mr. Deschler. Moderator. Christine Deschler, chair of the Arlington Finance Committee. Um, the Finance Committee voted unanimously to oppose adoption of this recently enacted legislation at this time. We do not oppose expanding the list of investment options for the town's trust funds. Indeed, we heartily support it. Before doing so, however, we think it prudent to take this opportunity now to engage in a thoughtful and unrushed process, one not constrained by artificial deadlines, to update the town's investment policy, which is eight years old. If there's no intent to move the funds very quickly and wait until the end of the year or the beginning of next year to update the policy after this board approves um, this article, um, the question becomes, well, why don't we just wait? If there's no, if we, if, what do we, we're missing out maybe on a few months of market gain or loss during that time period that will make little difference in the life of these funds which are intended to outlive us all. As I said, our existing investment policy is eight years old. Much has changed to our, our economy over these past eight years. Revisiting our existing policy would be appropriate no matter what. But even more so if we are contemplating taking on riskier investments pursuant to a state law passed less than a year ago with little in the way of evidence to inform us of how better off municipality trust funds would be with it. The Finance Committee would prefer not to put the cart before the horse. Let's first have an investment policy that will give clear guidance to our town officials and our investment advisors over the long haul, a policy created by Arlington for Arlington. What I say here tonight should not be deemed in any way as a reflection of any lack of confidence in our town manager, our town treasurer, the chair of our trust fund commissioners, or individual members of those trust committees or boards. I am fully confident that these skilled individuals will always put the interests of the town first, and we are lucky to have them. But again, these funds are to outlive us, outlive us all. We must prepare for when we do not have a Jim Feeney or a Julie Wayman or Augusta Haydock, and for when our investment advisors and managers change over time. Our investment policy should remain our constant, one that will guide those in charge of taking care of our funds, whoever they may be at the time. The Finance Committee has thoughtfully considered this article. In fact, we have discussed it at three separate meetings this year. We continue to strongly believe that we should have an updated investment policy first before adopting this legislation. We ask for no vote on this article. Thank you. Thank you. Can we switch over to the speaker queue so everyone can see the status of the queue? And uh, we'll take uh, the first speaker from the top, uh, uh, Ms. Olszewski. Uh, and then, let's see, we'll skip down to Mr. Solomon, who I don't believe we've heard from. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Angela Olszewski, Precinct 17, and I am a member of the Board of Commissioners of Trust Funds. Um, the first thing I have is a question to, I think it's gonna to be Town Council. I believe we were advised that the right order to do this in would, it would be to accept the legislation first and then revise the policy. Uh, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, I don't know if you caught uh, Ms. Olszewski's question, the, the order in which um, okay, can you repeat the question, Ms. Olszewski? Michael Kenny, I'm Town Council. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? The, the order for to do this in, I believe we were advised, was to accept the legislation first and then advise the policy. Yes, that's correct. It's an, it's an adoption of a local option, and then the town would, my understanding, the, the plan from the town administration would be to revise the policy after the adoption. Thank you. And the acceptance, um, just because, so the, for the body, that the, the, the acceptance of the, of, uh, would be 
the uh, an affirmative vote on this, the main motion here? Is that okay? That's correct. Thank you. Um, so you've already heard, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the desire for diversification of the portfolio, but I will tell you from my personal experience, when I found out that the trust funds were invested on the legal list, my reaction was, wow, I haven't heard that term in almost 40 years. My first job was in investment management. We invested the money of uh, several municipal retirement systems. It was the mid-80s, and the retirement boards were allowed to come off the legal list. Um, they could go into the PRIP fund, they could hire an investment manager. Um, so we were actually selling out some of those portfolios of restricted securities. It was the first step to allow the retirement systems to start eating into the great unfunded liability that had been created by pay-as-you-go funding and very minimal investment returns. So, you know, we hear about that we don't want to be first, so we've already discussed that there's other municipalities that have done this, and some of them had to do it by home rule legislation. But we did not invest the money for Arlington, but that retirement system is not on the legal list. Um, so I just want to put out that, that we already have a large pool of money. It's not a trust fund, um, but it's like one, and it pays under the control of the retirement board. It pays the benefits for a retirement system, and it is not invested on the legal list. Thank you. And let's see, and Mr. Solomon next, and then uh, I'll skip down, get some other new speakers. Uh, Mr. Grunko after that. Joe Solomon, Precinct 16. I had some questions about the town manager's letter. Um, I, I was wondering if we could just get an overview of the sequence of events that were laid out in that. Uh, Mr. Feeney? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Feeney, town manager. So the letter you're referring to, I assume, was the memo to the finance committee. And what that outlined was upon adoption of this local option here in the community, that would allow Arlington to reference the prudent investor rule in any uh, forthcoming policy investment statement or investment policy, as it's also known. So we could revise our investment policy to incorporate this rule once we had a draft policy uh, to circulate, we would do so with the select board and the finance committee to get feedback, and then to the round of uh, boards, committees, and commissions that actually oversee our trust funds. We've heard about the three here in Arlington. Uh, and then we would finalize that investment policy and incorporate it into our bid documents for the procurement of an, our next three years of investment services, which we would be doing this winter and executing a contract early uh, calendar year 2025. And would any investments be changed prior to all of these steps of updating policies and going through RFPs and, and involving all the other town committees? No. Okay, thank you. Okay, so that brings up uh, Mr. Grunko next, and then Ms. we'll skip down to Ms. Crowder. Zach Grunko, Precinct 13. Uh, I have a question. Will this allow um, the funds to be invested in um, index funds? In index fund, will it allow yes. investment in index funds? Is that or is it still going to be single stocks? Or single stocks. Um, let's see, Ms. Wayman or Mr. Feeney? Jim Feeney, town manager. What this would do is allow investments in single stocks or index funds. Okay. Frankly, I think it's, it's ludicrous that uh, we would invest in investing these funds in single stocks. It's just it's a very unreliable and, and, and poor rate of return and ri very risky. So I think uh, uh, an updated investment uh, strategy, you know, with these uh, large, much larger list of, um, you know, stocks and investment op uh, options would be uh, far better. So I will support this. Okay. Uh, Ms. Crowder and then Mr. Hanlon. Elaine Crowder, Precinct 19. Uh, just a quick question. Um, you mentioned that uh, you might miss an opportunity to um, uh, make, make a change before it needs to be rebid. How frequently uh, is the finance uh, thing rebid? Uh, Mr. Feeney or Ms. Wayman? 
Jim Feeney, town manager. Could you repeat the question, please, Elaine? How, how frequently is uh, the finance um, uh, contract rebid, finance advisor contract? So these investment management services are typically bid every three years, as with most of our contracts, but we have the opportunity with each bid. They're technically one-year contracts with options to renew twice for one-year period. So uh, a, a pause would not necessarily disrupt that too long. Uh, it can, you said it can be rebid every year. Is that what you just said? We likely wouldn't rebid it each okay. and every year, but we could reissue guidance, you know, likely after the first year. So it would be approximately a one-year delay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Hanlon and then Ms. Hyam. Patrick Hanlon, Precinct 5. Um, I have a question, perhaps, uh, on the study of the new investment policy. Um, assuming that this did not pass, and we still were looking at the uh, mass list as, a, uh, as our guide, what would the policy assume? Usually when you work out an investment policy, uh, you know what the legal standard is and what your objectives are first, and then you figure out what the policy is that will implement those objectives. And it's not clear to me um, if we don't adopt the prudent, uh, the prudent person rule, uh, it's not clear to me what it is that will guide the study in determining the investment policy. Would the committee that does the investment policy in either event be looking towards this rule as the rule that would ultimately would apply? Mr. Feeney? Jim Feeney, town manager. Uh, Mr. Hamlin, I got to admit, I, I didn't quite follow the question. I guess the question is whether, is whether if you're going to do an investment policy that assumes you're limited to the Massachusetts list and then redo the policy once you're not limited to the list, or whether you're going to be imagining that eventually you're going to use the prudent person rule and imagine that that and the implied object investment objectives uh, will ultimately be what determines and figure out what your investment policy is with that as your standard. <laughs> I, I gotta say, I think that with respect to an investment policy, what you're doing is setting guidelines or parameters for the products you're willing to choose, but with the equity side of the portfolio here, it will either be severely restricted or opened to uh, further options. So that will really tell an investment advisor how much flexibility they have with stock purchases or index fund purchases. Okay, thank you. So what I wanted to get at with all of this is that the, the prudent person rule has, has been the standard for trustees for over a century. Uh, I spent 30 years practicing law and it was already a hoary doctrine uh, by the time I started. Uh, so there's nothing unusual about that uh, and the flexibility that it gives most trustees. If you look at the mass list, one of the things that immediately pops out of you is that it violates one of the very first principles of the prudent person rule, and that is diversification. Look at the health list. You have practically the entire uh, pharmaceutical industry is listed there. It's one of the longest in all of the, uh, of all of the groups on, on the listing, and that's not diversified. That's putting everything in a single industry. If you were going to invest the way ordinary people do, uh, and you were picking a, a list of companies, you might look at the standard of poor's list. That's not 22 companies, that's 500 list companies. And that's often thought of as being too concentrated in the very high capital uh, companies, and that if you really wanted to be versified, you'd look at something more like the Wiltshire 3000. You can't even think about that in policy terms 
if you're doing an investment policy that is focused in on 22 companies. So it's not matter, it's just a matter of looking for a little extra return, of making sure that if, if Meta does well or Alphabet does well, that you'll do pretty well yourself. It's a matter of looking at the actual cons being conservative and looking at having an appropriate diversification in your stock portfolio. It would be crazy. In fact, it would probably uh, be a violation of fiduciary duty if a private fr trustee did anything like what we're doing right now. And yet, we're required by law to do it. It doesn't make any sense to me anyway. In terms of timing, it looks to me that, that there's no opposition or, or there doesn't seem to be opposition on the part of the Finance Committee to ultimately moving to the prudent person rule. Uh, the issue is one of timing, and, the one of ti and that issue comes back to the question of an investment policy. And I don't really understand what we would gain from starting off with an investment policy that assumed that we were limited to these 22 stocks and then shifting at some point on the ha happening of some occasion, which I don't understand, shifting over to making our objective to look at the entire stock market portfolio and figure out appropriate ways of, of investing the trust funds. And I'm entirely in agreement that even just looking at investing in individual stocks is a surprising thing to do for the funds of these size. Usually you would be looking for mutual funds and you'd be looking for, for minimizing your risk by getting a broader diversification than even you could get on, uh, than you could get on a much broader list of stocks. So it's time to, there's no re gain in delay. The delay is, seems to be there from primarily for its first place. The investment study ought to be looking at what you're going to do in order to comply what you're going to do in order to comply ultimately with the, with the prudent person rule, you shouldn't be going through a stage imagining that the prudent person rule will never be adopted. You should be starting right from the beginning and figuring what is prudent given the considerations that Ms. Wayman pointed out and what the kind of investment policy that the town ought to be doing in order to minimize risk, in order to obtain reasonable gains, uh, and in, in order to, to, have, uh, to preserve capital. And that's what immediate adoption of this rule would do. So I would encourage you all to do it. That's how I'm going to vote. Thank you. We'll take Ms. Hyam next, and then Mr. Andrew Fisher. Leepa Hyam, Precinct 15. I moved the article and all um, considerations before it. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate, and we have a second. All those in favor of terminating debate under Article 56, say yes. Yes. All those opposed, say no. No. Debate is terminated. So we'll now go to a vote on the main motion. It is a majority vote, and while we're bringing up the vote screen, um, I'm waiting for the... Uh, uh, for voting to open, I'll just summarize that uh, the main motion of Article 56 seeks to authorize investment in trust funds in accordance with the prudent investor rule established under Chapter 203C of the Massachusetts General Laws. Voting is now open. If you're in favor of authorizing uh, uh, such investments, um, press 1 for yes. If you're opposed, uh, press 2 for no and 3 to abstain. And again, this is a majority vote. Okay, voting is closed. And the motion is, uh, is affirmed. 134, I'm sorry, 137 in the affirmative, 39 in the negative, five abstentions. Um, that takes us to Article 57, uh, which was a no action uh, has recommended vote of no action. This was held from the consent agenda. Um, let's see. Did we have anyone who wanted to introduce this? Um, yeah, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Warden held, thank you, from, from the uh, consent agenda. Uh, this was inserted in the warrant at the request of the Director of uh, Planning and Community Development, um, Director Ricker. Um, uh, and Mr. Warden, uh, uh, I don't believe you have a substitute motion. I haven't seen one. Um. Okay. Uh, so seeing that we, we don't have a substitute motion and it is a recommended vote of no action, uh, uh, we will just proceed to, uh, let's see, and this is a majority vote. Um, 
so we'll just go directly to a voice vote on the main motion uh, of, of no action under F Article 57. Um, and uh, Mr. Cunningham, uh, you can correct me if, uh, like, since it's not a two-thirds vote, we don't require uh, an actual, like a specific tally, correct? Okay, so we'll just do this by voice vote. All those in favor of no action for the main motion of Article 50, 57 say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. And it is unanimous. We will take no action. Um, and that takes us to Article 59. Ms. Ms. Deschler? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, Article 59, uh, the town is obligated to provide um, health insurance and other benefits to retired employees. Um, like with pensions, this is a substantial liability that we carry on our books. Um, it's been the practice of town meeting to appropriate no less than $655,000 into OPEB each year. This year, an additional $150,000 is being added for a total of $805,000 um, consistent with the commitments made to the voters in last uh, November's override. The Finance Committee recommends a yes vote on Article 59. Okay, let's switch over to the speaker queue. This was, um, all, this was also on the consent agenda and this was held by Mr. Loretti. Uh, so let's uh, clear the speaker queue and uh, Mr. Loretti. Um, And also, I just want to remind, remind folks when, well, a reminder for everybody. First, for Mr. Loretti to try to stay within scope. Uh, and for everybody else, I actually do listen to what the speakers are saying. I don't need 50 people uh, shouting scope. So, Mr. Loretti, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. I had a couple questions um, related to Part B of this vote. And that um, section of the vote refers back to um, the increased share of HMO contributions that the select board voted in 2006. I wondered if anyone knew just what that share was. Ms. Deschler, anyone from the select board? Oh, uh, Mr. Tosti? Or Ms. Deschler? Back at that time, the uh, board of select, oh, Al Tosti, precinct, precinct 17. At the time, the uh, selectmen were being asked to reduce the uh, share paid by the town from 90% to 85%, basically increasing it uh, for the retirees from 10% to 15%. The Board of Selectmen at that time felt that if they were going to do that, that they wanted that money to go into the OPEB fund. So every year since then, uh, we've been putting in $155,000. Uh, at that time, the selectmen promised that if the 155 didn't go into the OPEB fund, they would ra they raise the town share back up to 90%. Okay, thank you. Uh, and one somewhat related question is, I wondered for these retirees, does the town require those uh, reaching the age of 65 to go on Medicare? I believe, I believe someone's saying yes. Um, but I can't see who. Oh, okay, uh, Mr. McGee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager, Finance Director. Yes, we do require people to go on to Medicare at 65. And is, is there a similar share of um, cost at that point for the additional Medicare charges that they face? Uh, I don't understand the question. I'm well, the, the other, the this talks about the uh, retiree share for HMO contributions. I'm wondering, is there a similar um, share for their um, whatever premiums they have to pay when they're on Medicare? Um, I'm still unclear exactly what you're asking. So, can we show on the, uh, maybe project on the display, uh, the vote language from Article 59 from the annotated warrant. This is Part B of the vote language. Uh, appropriates into said fund the sum of $155,000 representing the increased share, which I believe is what Mr. Loretti is referring to, of re retiree HMO contributions as voted by the select board, correct? Yeah, in 2006. I was curious since, since um, you know, the gentleman affirmed that those 65 and older have to go on Medicare, I'm just wondering what the town pays towards those Medicare premiums that they would have to pay. Does anyone have an answer to that question? Cameron Director of Human Resources. 
You want to know if the town contributes toward Medicare premiums? That's right. That those no, they do not. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. What I was okay. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Uh, uh, Mr. Jameson? Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, earlier in the, meet in the meeting, I spoke up to towards the retirement board and the large costs we have in pension costs. Um, that's for retiree salary pensions. This is essentially retirees, town retirees health care pension fund that we're, 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 we're starting. The town very astutely started paying into this many years ago, and so we have a, a small start into the amount of money that we will have to pay into after we complete funding the full, uh, fully the pension fund. So this is an important thing, and I recommend a, a positive vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, seeing no more speakers in the queue, we will go to a vote on the main motion of Article 59, and we have a point of order. Uh, Barry Jospin, Precinct 18. Is there a typo in C? Wasn't the vote in November 2023? Just checking. Uh, November 2024 in Part C of the vote language? Is that... Uh, wait, was this changed? Maybe... Do I have an old version in my browser? Let's see. Oh, there it is. Did part C just show up here? Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe, maybe, yeah. Yeah. So th there are three parts. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna go to a vote on the main motion. And just to summarize, this is for making a a three appropriations into the other post-employment benefits or OPEB trust fund for the amounts of. A, $500,000, B, $155,000, and C, $150,000. The details are in the vote language. Voting is now open. If you're in favor of those appropriations into the OPEB trust fund, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. Okay, voting is closed. And the motion passes, 175 in the affirmative, one in the negative, four abstentions. That takes us to Article 64. Ms. Deschler? Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I move that we table Article 64 until we have uh, dealt with Article 65, because the, it's possible the amount in 64 will change if anything has changed in Article 65. Okay. Uh, actually, well, just, uh, just FYI, if we postpone until after 65, it's a lower threshold, if, if you prefer. Or just, you just want to table, because two-thirds? Okay. All right, so we have a motion to table Article 64 with the intention of taking it up after Article 65 to invert the order. Um, we have a second. All those in favor of laying Article, Article 64 on the table, say yes. yes. All those opposed, say no. Article 64 is on the table. It's a um, unanimous vote. That takes us to Article 65. Uh, Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. We are happy to report that the town has settled with several unions and managers and non-union employees. You are being asked in Article 65 to appropriate money to fund wage increases associated with those contracts. Uh, and because the town continues to negotiate with additional unions, you're also being asked in Article 65 to appropriate money in the salary reserve fund. Um, the amounts you're being asked to appropriate are those amounts in the Finance Committee's supplemental report. Um, the Finance Committee recommends a favorable action on Article 63, and I believe if you have any, have any additional questions on the contracts, I think the Deputy Town Manager would be able to answer any. Thank you. And this is Article 65. Right? Um, uh, so. Let's switch over to the speaker queue and clear that. Let's see if anyone wishes to speak. Okay, let's clear the speaker queue. Okay, speaker queue is now open. Seeing no speakers, uh, we will proceed to a vote on the main motion of Article 65 for collective bargaining. Uh, and this is a majority vote. Oh, we, 
Oh, uh, okay. Uh, we'll take uh, Mr. Jameson and then Mr. Greenspawn. Gordon Jameson, um, Precinct 12. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm, never mind, I found the numbers I was looking for, the, the additional, additional monies. They were not, not with the long list. Thank you very much. My, my, okay, my and mind. just, uh, I don't know if this is related to what Mr. Jameson was looking for, but there is, uh, there is information, in, relevant information in the Supplemental Finance Committee report published on May 9th, that, which I believe the annotated warrant has already been updated with that information, correct? Yeah. Uh, so we'll take uh, uh, Mr. Hall, uh, Hallman, did you wish to speak? Aram Holman, Precinct 6. Uh, could somebody answer why the additional sum of 573000 and something for various other contracts are included with this? Uh, Ms. Deschler or, or, Mr., or Mr. McGee? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Alex McGee, Deputy Town Manager, Finance Director. That money is being set aside for uh, other collective bargaining units who we are not yet settled with. So our three public safety units, so that's our patrol officers, our ranking officers, and our fire union. And so this money is essentially being reserved into a salary reserve account, and then when we ultimately do settle with them, it will go towards those contracts. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other speakers in the queue, we'll proceed to a vote on the main motion. And while we're uh, bringing up the vote screen, this is to appropriate $534,251 for funding future collective bargaining agreements and appropriate and transfer $573,031 into various departmental budgets as specified in the Supplemental Finance Committee report published May 9th. Voting is now open. If you're in favor of those appropriations, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no or three to abstain. And this is majority vote. And this is Article 65. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 174 in the affirmative, four in the negative, one abstention. That takes, uh, Ms. Deschler? It would take us to 66, but. 64. But you wanna uh, remove from the table? Um. Christine Deschler, Chair of the Finance Committee. Um, the last finance article before you is Article 64. And this is the vote that- oh, you, you need to take it off the table first. Yep. Um, I move that we take 64 off the table. Okay, we have a, a motion to remove six, Article 64 from the table and a second. All those in favor say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. It is unanimous. 64 is now before us. Ms. Deschler. Thank you. This is the vote that balances the budget. Um, the, uh, whenever monies are raised from successful override votes um, in Arlington, the funds are accumulated in the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund. And then monies are taken, drawn down to fund budgets going forward by a vote of town meeting, and that's what you are being asked to do. The amount that you're being asked to appropriate tonight is $4,374,790, and that is the amount that, need, that we need to balance the FY25 budget. Finance Committee asked for a favorable vote on Article 64. Okay, let's, uh, sw let's switch over to the speaker queue and clear that. Um, okay, the speaker queue is now open for Article 64. Yeah, and this is a, a two thirds vote um, when we actually get around to voting it. Uh, Mrs. Krajewski? Pass, okay. Mr. Hurd. Okay, going once, going twice. Uh, speaker queue is now closed. We will uh, proceed to a vote on the main motion of Article 64, which is a two-thirds vote. Voting is now open. This would appropriate $4,374,790 from the Fiscal Stability Stabilization Fund. If you're, uh, and is the two-thirds vote, uh, press one if you wish to approve that appropriation, two to reject that appropriation, and three to abstain.
Okay, voting is now closed. And it is unanimous, 179 in the affirmative uh, and uh, no negative votes. Um, so the motion passes. Um, that takes us now to the uh, final article, other than Article 3, of course. Uh, it is 960. I guess we can just, we, we have a limited number of speakers, so I say we just go ahead with this instead of taking a break. Um, the, the Article 66, uh, Mr. DeCourcy, did you want to lead us off? And this is a resolution article, so it's a limited speaker queue. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve DeCourcy, Chair of the Select Board. The Select Board voted three to one. Uh, Mr. Hurd was not present. Mr. Diggins voted in the negative to support the resolution. Our contribution to the resolution um, concerned the third to last and second to last whereas is on, on the page concerning Arlington's assessment and, and uh, what is considered the, the relative unfairness of that assessment uh, as compared with other communities. Um, I think there's a slide as well for Article 66, just briefly. This concerns the first whereas, if it's available. It, it, it's a picture. Yeah, this, this is the uh, amendment. Yeah. It's not that important if you can't find it. <laughs> okay. It's the cover. So, yeah, yeah, okay, there it is there. Article 66. That, the first whereas talks about the streetcar last running in 1955. That is a streetcar running up Mass Ave by the foot of the rocks sometime before 1955. Okay. Okay. So... We'll now take uh, Mr. Slickman uh, to offer, he is the, the petitioner and the proponent uh, of the resolution. Mr. Slickman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I would have been happy to have this resolution pass on the consent agenda or to spend no more than a minute encouraging a yes vote. However, as a speaker signed up to oppose this resolution, I feel compelled to make the case. Why are we spending Mondays and Wednesdays sitting in these brown plastic chairs? There is nothing comfortable or prestigious about these seats. We are here to make a difference, to make Arlington a better town, to meet our town's challenges. We know the major challenges that we face revolve around housing, affordability, and transportation. They are intertwined just as they were 100, 120 years ago. Our town developed around the Boston Electric Railway and the four competing Boston and Maine railroad stations. The pattern continues today. As we adopt new zoning bylaws, increase the residential density, and encourage mixed-use development along the Mass Ave corridor. In October, we voted 189 to 35 to exceed the zoning requirements of the MBTA Communities Act. In short, we are building a more transit-oriented community. We're just missing the transit. The streetcars are gone. The trains are gone. The residual bus service is deteriorating. We build bus lanes while we reduce service to three or four buses per hour, often bunched. The T operated the green, opened the Green Line extension with a terminal just 10 minutes from Arlington Center, and the following week they reduced connecting bus service to 45 minute headways on weekdays and 70 minutes on Sunday. Ridership is off? Well, yeah. How many times do you need to spend 20 30, 40 minutes standing on a street corner before you seek another option. Yes, we passed a similar resolution last year before Monica Tibbetts Nutt became Transportation Secretary and Philip Ang came to run the tea from, in Boston. 
I ask you to try again because they give me hope. Secretary Tibbetts Nutt and General Manager Eng have proven to be responsive leaders. Responsive, which means they respond if we ask for a response. And that's what we're doing with our yes vote. We are Arlington's elected legislators. We have a responsibility to be advocates for our voters, for our residents, for everyone who relies on the MBTA to travel in Arlington. Friends, this is not a spectator sport. Voters didn't elect us to sit here and do nothing. We don't have a lot of leverage, but we put those brown plastic chairs together to unify our voice. A no vote dilutes that vo voice. A no vote drains the power the voters placed in our hands. A no vote tells the MBTA, it's okay. Don't worry about us. Arlington doesn't matter. Let me finish by quoting Arlington resident and Rabbi Carrie Bricklin Small, who said, what we believe is possible, we are willing to work for. Therefore, what we believe is possible shapes the contours of what is possible because we're the only ones who are going to be doing the work of change. Let's believe and do the work. Please vote yes for the Benson Amendment and vote yes for the main motion under Article 66. Thank you. Uh, before we take Mr. Benson's amendment, I did want to ask, uh, since the, the resolution, if you bring up the uh, text of the resolution, uh, it does uh, suggest that uh, the town clerk, uh, like if, if it passes, that, that, that the town clerk would transmit uh, a copy of the resolution to state and congressional officials. I just want to ask, since this is a non-binding resolution, uh, to offer uh, 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 Ms. Brazil, um, would, would you intend to follow through on that since you're not bound to by the vote? Yes, it's on provided a list. Uh, the, the clerk says yes, uh, she would transmit it uh, if she's provided a list of those officials. Names and addresses. Names and addresses. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Benson? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eugene Benson, Precinct 10. I'm gonna be quickly telling you why I put the, in this amendment and why I think it's important. I put in the amendment, and you've probably read it already, to give a more complete picture of the reduction in bus service that's happened in Arlington in the past two years. I've added the 79 bus route, which no longer exists, and the 84 bus route, which no longer exists. I've also added that the MBTA Better Bus Project will move the 67 bus, so we'll no longer have a 67 bus on Pleasant Street that goes to and from the Elwife Station. I've also asked that the resolution also be sent to Thomas Glynn, who's the new chair of the MBTA Board of Directors, who was not on the list. So why is this necessary? I think it's necessary because if we're going to paint a complete picture of what's happened to Arlington, what the reduction in public transit has been, it should be a complete picture. Now, I'm not thinking that all of this will come back anytime soon, if at all, but I am thinking we have to start with what our baseline is now and what it had been before. Just a little background on my um, professional dealings with the MBTA from 2003 to 2013 one of my jobs was to be the general counsel for the T-Riders Union in Boston. Another one of my jobs was to be general counsel to another organization called the Greater Boston Transit Justice Network. I don't think that one exists anymore. But we spent a lot of time lobbying the T, lobbying the T general manager, 
lobbying the T Board of Directors, and we had some success. We got some reductions in the amount of some of the fare increases. We got some other commitments from the T, like creating a rider site over committee. I fear if we take this resolution, just send it over the transom to the T, to the T Board, absolutely nothing will happen. But if we take this resolution as a starting point, if some of us, and I hope maybe some of the members of the select board will go with us down to one of the T board meetings and start talking to them, we can make a difference. The T is going to have to decide what to do as we come out of the pandemic and they look at what ridership is like. If we're not there, if we're not making a case for ourselves, we will probably lose more transit. When they were going through the Better Bus Project, I think Mr. Schlickman and I were the only two people I saw from Arlington who were on the Zooms who said, don't reduce this bus service to us. From some other communities, you had many elected officials there saying, don't reduce bus service. I think we have an obligation to our riders, the 67, goes right through Precinct 10, which is my precinct. There were signs, and I didn't put them up, on Pleasant Street saying, don't take away our 67 bus, but they're going to do it anyhow. That was the bus I took to Boston before I retired when I worked in Boston. Let's pass this, let's pass the amendment, and let's try to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now take Mr. Diggins, uh, who requested to speak in opposition to the resolution. Thank you, Ms. Moderator. Leonard Diggins, Precinct 3. As I was composing this little speech, I found myself wondering if aliens landed and they offered us world peace or a really good MBTA, which would we take? We'd probably go for world peace, but it would be a tough decision for some of us. Humor aside, I'm a member of Arlington's Transportation Advisory Committee, and as a member of that committee, I represent Arlington on the MBTA's advisory board, which is composed of representatives of 176 municipalities served by the MBTA. I am also the chair of the Regional Transportation Advisory Council, and as such, I have a seat on the board of the Boston Region Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO, which is responsible for all of the federal transportation, I'm sorry, federal highway transportation and federal transit spending in the Boston region, which encompasses 97 municipalities. The MPO directly selects highway and transit projects that are that amount to about four to five billion dollars over the course of its 20-year long-range transportation plan. Finally, I've been a member of the MBTA Rider Oversight Committee, which Mr. Benson helped create, and Mr. Benson actually selected me uh, for that committee uh, since its inception 20 years ago, and I've participated in three to four MBTA-related meetings per month since then. If these qualifications aren't enough, then perhaps this T-shirt that I got working on the bus rapid transit pilot in East Arlington back in 2018 will help me cross the threshold of credibility. In any case, over the last 20 years, I've become very familiar with the way transportation and transit works in our area. And as many of you know, what can look like simple solutions from one side of the table are anything but simple from the other side if for no other reason than just working with other independent entities is often harder and takes more time than expected. I lay all this out because at the heart of success, of the success and just the functional existence of our region is a level of collaboration that isn't required in other parts of the country. As I said many times, in most other parts of the country, Arlington would essentially be a neighborhood of Boston or just a small entity within Middlesex County. The quirk of history that has given municipalities in this state such independence absolutely requires that we cooperate and collaborate. Any system is only as strong as its weakest component, and our form of governance requires even more so that we look even requires even more so that we look out for each other, especially when it comes to transportation, which is the key to our economic health and well-being. Everything depends on moving people and goods from point A to point B. And when points A and B span over more than one municipal boundary, cooperation 
isn't really an option, it's a necessity. Thankfully, there is much effective cooperation in the region. Arlington has an excellent reputation in the region for being progressive and innovative, and Arlington is seen as a leader in promoting policies and practices that will benefit the region. At times, such leadership requires realizing that the needs of others are greater than ours and they need to have a higher priority. The situation with MBTA is complex. In what may be considered a cautionary tale to us and our financial decisions, in my not so humble opinion, the current state of repair, this repair and this, fun this function was caused by those who were loath to make necessary investments in MBTA staff. Indeed, the MBTA was put in a financial situation whereby it had to reduce headcount when it should have been doing otherwise in order to demonstrate to the legislative and executive branches on Beacon Hill that it was lean and mean. Now, due to the pandemic, ridership patterns have changed and most modes of transit are seeing fewer riders. Without a lot more funds, it will be impossible, it is impossible to increase service and the current ridership trends make it hard to justify increasing service. So changes that the MPTA makes to improve service in areas that it need it most will at times have an impact on areas where there are fewer riders and more alternatives. It may mean that instead of a single seat ride, some riders may have to make transfers. It may mean that some routes will change or be eliminated and riders may have to take buses to different stations. It's actually a lot more complex than this, but I only have seven minutes and I want to stay in scope. Now, I know the proponents of this resolution and many Ar Arlingtonians feel that they've been neglected or even worse, slighted by the actions of MTA with its best bus network redesign. I also know that staff at the MBTA viewed and heard all the feedback it received, which included hundreds, and I was told thousands, it, um, that came from Arlington, and, and I don't know if they were unique, me, but it was, a, it was an astounding number. And I also know that the MBTA prioritized equity in the initial design and the revised designs. I also know that the T will roll out the changes slowly and that it will, oops, I just lost my screen. Um, uh, let's see, there we go. All right, and that it will look at the impact of those changes. Now, I don't know the extent to which the MBTA is continuing to feel pressure from other communities regarding the bus network redesign, but I support their efforts to stay the course and especially to resist political pressure. If they easily bend to political pressure, then it is likely that few of the needed improvements will be made and are those with the most influence who may not reside in Arlington will get what they want. Left to my own devices, instead of sending a letter or this resolution stipulated by this resolution, I would send a letter expressing my appreciation for the outreach effort that the MBTA put into the bus network redesign project. I would state my concerns about the impact on Arlington and offer to work with them to mitigate any negative effects. I would also welcome them to reach out to us when they have new ideas they would like to discuss. And I would let them know of our commitment to collaborating with them to make the system more accessible for all riders, especially those who have the greatest needs. So what to do about the resolution? Well, vote your conscience or what you think is in your political interest. As a member of the select board, I recommend no action instead of abstaining. But since that vote, as a town meeting member, I've now taken a position that I will not vote on any resolutions at all. Regardless of the outcome of this vote, though, I'm committed to making sure that Arlington maintains its stellar reputation for working with others and to make the region and the Commonwealth better for all. Thank you. Okay, there, there, there were a couple of folks who um, requested to speak in the speaker queue, but uh, there is no live speaker queue for resolution articles. Uh, so we will proceed to uh, uh, first a vote on the Benson Amendment and then a vote on the main motion. Um, so we'll now take up a vote on the Benson Amendment. Which uh, mentions elimination of the 84 and 79 bus routes, uh, planned rerouting of the 67 bus uh, away from Pleasant Street and assurance of continued bus service on Pleasant Street and inclusion of the chair of the MBTA board of directors among the recipients that the re resolution is sent to. Voting is now open. If you're in favor of the Benson Amendment, press one for yes. If you're opposed, press two for no, or three to abstain. OK, 
Okay, let's close voting. And the Benson Amendment passes. Uh, 152 in the affirmative, uh, 13 in the negative, five abstentions. That takes us now to a vote on the main motion uh, as amended by the Benson Amendment. Again, this is a resolution call, uh, under Article 66 calling for improvements to service provided by the MBTA in Arlington. Voting is now open. If, uh, if you're in favor of the resolution as amended by the Benson Amendment, you'd press one for yes. Uh, if you're opposed to the resolution, press two for no or three to abstain. Okay, let's close voting. And the motion passes, 155 in the affirmative, nine in the negative, and 12 abstentions. Um, we have one article remaining, Ms. Deschler, uh, Article 3. Yeah. Christine Deschler, Finance Committee Chair. I move that Article 3 be taken from the table. Okay, we have a motion to take Article 3 from the table. Uh, all, and a second, all those in favor of taking Article 3 from the table, this is the last thing we need to do basically before dissolution. Uh, uh, all those in favor of taking Article 3 from the table say yes. yes. All those opposed say no. no. Come on. It's, <laughs> it's a majority vote. It's a majority vote. Um, please heckle the person who did that, please. Ms. Deschler. Um, and so Article 3, there's no more reports to receive, so Article 3 is now disposed. Mr. Moderator, it is moved that the 2024 annual Arlington Town Meeting be dissolved. Okay, we have a second for a motion to dissolve. All those in favor of, it, of dissolution of the meeting, say yes. yes. All those opposed, I don't know what we would do, but say no. <laughs> it is unanimous. The 2024 annual town meeting is dissolved. Okay. Everyone, please remember to leave your clickers. Uh... ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com ACMI to learn how you can help.